Good morning, everyone. We're glad to have you come be here this morning. We thank God for allowing us to be here this morning to begin our worship service of celebrating of 184 years of existence as a family of Hosey Temple Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, we will begin our program, and as Ms. Cobb gets in her position, to be our worship leader. And we will begin and follow the order of worship um, as accord accordingly. Good morning, and thank you. Thank you for worshiping with us here at Holsey Temple CME Church. Thank you for worshiping with us in person at 1011 Washington Avenue, Macon, Georgia, 31201 with Reverend Michael Cahill, Sr., Pastor. Also, thank you for those of you worshiping with us on Zoom and with us live on Facebook. Our order of worship today, today's Sunday, July 16th, 2023. This is our church anniversary service, and we are celebrating a beautiful theme, celebrating 184 years of Christian faith and the boldness to embrace what's new, what's now and next. And this theme comes based out of the scripture from Psalms 138, verse 3. Well, good morning. I am your worship leader, Sister Avril Cobb, and it's good to be back home. This is where I started. We can go all the way back to I was christened right down here. So it is wonderful to be back home celebrating 184 years back here at Holsey Temple CME Church. We'll go to the call to worship. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand for our opening hymn, We Are Soldiers in the Army.
Amen. Amen. As being soldiers in this army, we do have some, we're, we're following up with prayers, but the importance or the impact of these prayers, these are coming from our soldiers who are growing up in the army. These are our children, the ones who are going to take our places and keep this, keep this battle going forward. Our first prayer will come from Todd Hurst III, Kristen Hurst, and Taylor Hurst. And our second prayer will come from Wesley Alexander Price and Chandler Edward Price. So, dear God, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for health and strength. Thank you for our church family, and we thank you for 185 years of teaching us all how to love. God, continue to watch over us as we continue to love one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 My name is Chandler Edward Price, and this is to Reverend Michael Hill and the Fulton family. Happy 184th anniversary. Hello, my name is Wesley Alexander Price. Please join me while we do Psalm, while we go to Psalm 84, verse 11. The Lord is our protector and glorious King, blessing us with the kindness and honor. He does not refuse any good thing to those who do what is right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for 184 years to this ministry of this to this community. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 There's something extra special about receiving the prayers from the children. Well, next, we will have our scripture reading by Sister Mallory Gaddis, followed by the welcome by Sister Judy Hooks. Good morning. I'll be reading from Psalms 138, verses 1 through 5. I give you thanks, O Lord, my whole heart. Before the God, I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name, steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increase my strength of soul. All of the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of God. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Hosea Temple CME Church here in Macon, Georgia. On behalf of Reverend Michael K. Hill Sr. and First Lady Sandra Alexander Hill, I extend a warm welcome to each one of you. A very special welcome and thank you to Bishop Thomas L. Brown and Dr. Louise Baker Brown for worshiping with us today. And again, to all members, friends, and guests, welcome. As we celebrate our 184th church anniversary, I ask each member to reflect on the history of this historic church and the impact of this church in your spiritual journey. As a child, Sunday school taught by Mrs. Maddie Fountain, followed by a worship service filled with reverent prayers, congregational hymns, anthems sung by the senior choir and selections by the youth choir, are the most special memories for me. And I know each of you have precious memories as well. There are far too many saints to name one by one, 
that built, sustained, and grew this church during these 184 years. Today, we honor, remember, and thank them. We are now challenged to be bold enough to continue the legacy by rebuilding a vibrant church that will last another 184 years and beyond. Enjoy today's worship experience, and remember, you are always welcome to come as you are here at Holsey Temple CME Church in Macon, Georgia. God bless. I hope you feel as welcome as I do. It's good to be back home and to be sharing in this great accomplishment of still standing after 184 years. At this time, we will have our church history uh, presented by Brother Charles Rutland. And after the church history, we will also have the pastoral, pastoral prayer by Minister Zena Jenkins. Uh, good morning, Hosey. I um, was approached by Lynn, Reverend Hopkins. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've known her all my life. But <laughs> and she said, we want you to do the church history. I said, okay, fine. And she reminded me, she was very polite, but she let me know. And now you can't, you know, we, we got to get in and out of there because we got the people on Zoom and we got the people on Facebook. So I promise you this morning, Lynn, I'll be brief no matter how long it takes. <laughs> it, it really is an honor and a privilege, uh, and, and I love history, and, and I, I do have to say this, uh, I really enjoyed that song, and of course it flashed me back to my memories of Miss Jasper, Catherine Jasper, who started a youth choir that was just, just powerful. And, and I always flash back, because for some reason, and I think I'm the only one, I never joined the choir. I'd never joined the choir. She said, come on, Charles, everybody got one song. <laughs> but we never found mine. But tell me what Miss Jasper did do, and she used to bother me. I, I just, I, I was young and immature. She would always call me and talk to me about the history, the history of our family, the history of our church, history. She would just, I, I don't know how she picked me or why she picked me. Like I said, it used to irritate me but apparently some of it stuck. You know, my, when I was growing up, my grandmama used to say, you plant a seed in darkness and it grows to the light. And she planted a seed in the darkness of my mind and uh, it, it looks like it, it's grown to the light. So I really want to thank, uh, I'm standing here today to a large extent because of Miss Catherine Pitts Jasper. A wise man once said that a tree without roots is dead so is a people without their history or cultural roots of dead people. And I fear that some of us may feel that church anniversaries focus too much on the past. Uh, we get bored with history. I know I was like that when I was in school, but I became excited about history when I went to college. I went to college at Florida a &M University and I had a history teacher by the name of Dr. Larry Rivers. Some of us here making no Dr. Rivers because he went on to become the president of Fort Valley State University, you may remember. But he was my history teacher. And for the first time sitting in his history class, I could see myself in the book. He had a way to bring us in the book. And so this morning, as we talk about 184 years of history, I want to just present some information that I hope will contextualize exactly what that means. Because it's hard to imagine 184 years. We consider ourselves old when we're 70, uh, or certainly four score years. And now we're talking about a church, an institution that's nine score and four. <clears throat> 1839 is where we trace our beginning. It actually could be before then, but 1839 is when uh, our white Christian brothers at Mulberry Street United Methodist Church kicked us out of their building and told us we had to get our own building because we were upstairs in, in, in heaven worshiping and, and just carrying on too much. They couldn't stand it. They said, y'all need to get your own building. 
And so that happened in 1839, and that's where we trace the beginning of our history. Now, the interesting thing about that is we are part of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, the CME Church. We started in 1839, but the CME Church started in 1870. We're older than our denomination. <clears throat> In 1839, Martin Van Buren was president of the United States. He was the seventh president of the United States. And now we're on Joe Biden, number 46. So Hosea Temple has been here for 39 out of 46 United States presidents. 39 out of 46. <clears throat> In 1839, there weren't 50 stars on the flag. There were 26 stars on the flag. And if you went west, you were going to New Orleans. <laughs> there were no states west of the Mississippi River. In 1839, there was a country lawyer from Kentucky who was given a license to practice law in Illinois. He went on to become the 16th president of the United States and is now known as the Great Emancipator. I'm talking about Abraham Lincoln. He became a lawyer in 1839. Something that's really significant for Macon, you know, growing up here, I took the field trip to the Indian Mounds. You know, we all been to the Indian Mounds, right? And you got all of, you got Okmulgee, Tobasaki, Saki, you got all of these Indian names around here. But I didn't know one Indian growing up. Not one. Not one. I mean, other than, you know, you know how black people claim to be Indian, but, but I'm talking about <laughs> an Indian. <laughs> well, in 1839, General Winfield Scott came to Georgia and passed through Macon. Uh, he had been ordered by the president and General Andrew Jackson to round up the savages. That's when the Trail of Tears began in Macon, Georgia. They got the Creek, they got the Cherokees, they got the Muscogee and the Seminole, and they walked them from Georgia to Oklahoma. They made the march there, and it was so horrendous, it was called the Trail of Tears. <clears throat> now, there was big news around the world in 1839, too, happening right here in the United States. 49 Africans, led by Joseph Sinke, took over a slave ship called the Amistad and demanded that the captain take them back to Sierra Leone. Now, that's gangsta, ain't it? I tell some of these young people, y'all want to be thugs? You need to be a thug like that. Instead, they ended up in Boston, and they were defended in court, successfully, I might say, all the way to the Supreme Court by John Quincy Adams, who was the fourth president of the United States. But we were in existence then. <clears throat> in 18... Those of you who really know me, you know I'm a big baseball fan, and I'm real happy with how the Braves are doing this year. Well, in 1839, Abner Doubleday founded baseball in Cooperstown, New York. Here in Macon, we know about Wesleyan College, <clears throat> the first college to grant degrees to women. Wesleyan was founded in 1839. Our first, or, or our namesake, is Bishop Luce, Lucius Holsey. In 1839, as the old folks used to say, he wasn't even thought of. Bishop Holsey wasn't born until 1842. So the only business that's in Macon today that was in Macon when Holsey Temple started, and it's barely here, is the Macon Telegraph. That's the only business that was in existence in 1839 that's still here. And speaking of Macon, this is our cent bicentennial, 200 years. Just think about the fact that Hosea Temple has been here for 184 of those 200 years. Over 90% of the time, we've been here. So it's more than just numbers. It's really a reason for a source of pride in our past it's inspiration for today. It's hope for the future. You know, uh, as a congregation, we can say we've been through it all. Through it all. 
And I hope that we've learned to trust in Jesus, that we've learned to trust in God. Thank you very much. As pastor joins us, it's, it's something special about hearing the history and being able to put numbers behind how far back this establishment has been in place. So just amazing. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are a worshiping church. Hallelujah, Lord God. Praise your name, Lord God. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for your worship. This is Hosea Temple CME Church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord God. Praise your name, Lord God. This is usually our time for our pastoral prayer. And what we would do is, it would be an altar call. So I want you to spiritually place yourself at the altar right now. If there's any concerns or anything that you want to lay upon God's altar, we're going to give you a second to lay it on the altar right now. Lord God, we thank you for 84 years, allowing us to worship you, to praise you, to honor your church, to honor you in your church called Hosea Temple CME. We thank you for those who wrote the vision, who made it plain. We thank you for those who read the vision and ran with it. We thank you for the body of believers, the families that you, you strategically placed in your house. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have, the sa have not the same office, we thank you for those who were the eyes that watched and prayed. We thank you for those who was in the ears that heard what the Spirit was saying. We thank you for those that were the mind, had the mind of Christ, the heart to trust in the Lord. We thank you for those who were the hands, and whatever they did, they did with all their might. And those whose steps were ordered by the Lord. You have laid a foundation for us. Help us, God, to be careful, to be careful, to be careful how we build on it. Thank you, Lord. Give us wisdom as we walk into the future. We thank you for the blessings of the past. We thank you for the blessings of this present time. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of the future. We have heard, the, you have heard the prayers that were placed on the altar. You know what they have need of, and we know that there's nothing too hard for you. Have a mercy on us, God. 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 Nothing too hard for you. Healing is not too hard. Deliverance is not too hard. Prosperity is not too hard. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. This is your house, God. We are your people, Lord God. Have your way in this place today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations that flow from my heart the meditations that flow from my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, my redeemer, your redeemer. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen.
Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. At this time, we want to lift the invitation for the offering, the giving of your tithes and your offering. We want to thank you for what you've already done, what you're doing, and support of the ministry here at Holston Temple, Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. And uh, you and we are asking on this particular day of celebration, those we asked our members and our friends who are willing to give $184 above your tithes and offering this day uh, in celebration of our 184 years of existence as a, a family of Hosey Temple Christian and Methodist Episcopal Church. You can do that by uh, giving or mailing or s s giving your, your, uh, your gifts uh, through the mailbox at 1011 Washington Avenue, here located in Macon, Georgia. Our zip code is 31201. Or you could also give online on the Giblify, your mobile app. Again, you will search for Hosey Temple Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Again, uh, Sister Hooks is, has grabbed the basket. And for those who are here you and are prepared to, to give your gifts, you may give it to her at this moment. And we will be so ever, ever so careful to give you give God the praise to give God the glory for the things he has done. You know, you heard, you have already heard the existence of 184 years. But if you look at the cornerstone, cornerstone or the threshold, you'll see that we've been at this location for over 128 years. 128 years. And so we want to, again, thank you for the for the ancestors and for those who were, you know, in 1839, most of our ancestors were enslaved or just recently emancipated. emancipated. So uh, we, we begin on humble beginnings, yet they took pennies and put something magnificent like this together. And so again, we want to thank those ancestors we want to thank those we remember. We want to thank you and uh, our children who are coming behind us, hopefully to continue to exist for another 184 years. Let us bless this offering. All things come of you, O Lord, and of thine own have we given you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me introduce the speaker, uh, the preacher, for the hour this morning. My presiding prelay, the Bishop Thomas L. Brown, Sr. Bishop Brown was elected as the 54th Bishop of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, June 28, 2006, in Memphis, Tennessee. I clearly remember that because I happen to have been his student at Phillips School of Theology at the ITC in Atlanta. Uh, it was then Dean Brown, you heard William, the William Brothers sung a song called Our Parents Drug Us to Church or something. I was drugged to church or something. I felt like Dean Brown at that time was dragging me to, to the school of uh, the seminary because uh, I, I knew Bishop Brown then at, uh, of, of him, of him. And I don't know what made me uh, ask him a question. <laughs> and uh, I said, I don't have the money to go to school, Bishop. I don't have the money to go to school, Dean. He started giving these applications, and next thing I know, I'm getting these 
student, federal student loan applications and stuff. And uh, I remember the day Lynn and I went to the first, the fall uh, enrollment, both of us kind of puzzled. We drove together, both of us were puzzled as we was traveling saying, you know, we ain't got no money. I don't know how we're going to be registered. And they kept telling us, you won't be registered class until you pay, right? But somehow on our way, we went through that whole day mystified of how we're going to enroll. <laughs> but on that day home, we was enrolled. And I, the only thing I can do is praise God because we just didn't see the way. But God, as, as uh, one of my faith beloved people, L.A. Wilson said, God made a way out of nowhere. And so I was in school at the time Dean Brown was elected to be Bishop Brown. And we greatly celebrate his being elected and serving. He served first in the District 4, Episcopal 4 District, which included, I believe, Louisiana and Mississippi. And we are delighted in 2018 when he was appointed here back to Georgia. He's from uh, Mississippi. What, what is it? Oakland, Mississippi. But he's really has been, uh, he a Georgia boy now. <laughs> I mean, he didn't serve so many, he didn't serve so long. He served 16 years as a dean of Phillips School of Theology. And in and, and his service there, he presented the first pastor conference. You, ever, you, keep me here, you keep hearing me about pastor's conference. I was saying we're going to pastor's conference. It was under Dean Brown at the time that that conference was developed. It's the most influential conference I ever attended. Uh, so he, he served there for 16 years before he was elected. And now he's serving here in the 6th Episcopal District, which is the state of Georgia. He is married to the lovely Dr. Louise Baker Brown. She's with her this morning, and we thank her for being with her, his, um, his partner in the ministry. They are parents, Carissa, Nicole Brown Jefferson, and Thomas Brown Jr. He's, they are grandparents to uh, Ariel, Mariah, Kingston, Albert, Elena, Joel Jefferson, Orlando, Thomas Brown, Tyson, Louis Brown, Judah, Elijah Brown, and the list goes on. We just, we are just so happy <laughs> to, to have them with us this day. He's also been pastoring of, of churches throughout the area of Georgia as far as Butler Street. Uh, last time I remember him pastoring was at College Park. Uh, in Atlanta, um, but he served all over the state. We are delighted to have him to be with us. He's, he is not only my presiding prelate, but I claim him as my friend. You know, very seldom can you find your supervisors that become your friend as well, and a commandant and a mentor to me as well in the pastoral position. And we are blessed, we are blessed to have a quality person as he is, as Sister Brown, to serve, be serving in the position of the presiding prelate of the, of the uh, Sixth Episcopal District, which is the state of Georgia. The next voice you will hear after we sing <laughs> is none other than my good friend and my bishop, Bishop Thomas L. Brown, Sr.
If you want to know where I'm going, where I'm going soon. If anybody asks you where I'm going, where of God said amen. amen. It is with joy and with thanksgiving that I stand in this preaching place on this historic moment in the life of this historic church to say greetings from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you Pastor Hill, First Lady Hill, for your graciousness and indeed your friendship and for feeling like I had a, the Lord had a word to say through me to you on this day. I thank you, Ms. Hobb, for your leading us in worship. All the participants who have uh, played a role from the children praying, to the scriptures, to the history of the occasion, and to all that you do, including your presence. It's a good day to be in the Lord's house. Good day to be in the Lord's house. And I thank you, uh, my wife, Dr. Louise, and I, for this privilege to be here today. Uh, I was sitting there thinking that um, I've known of this church since 1973 uh, when we first came to Georgia to seminary from Mississippi. And uh, where I came from in the countryside of Mississippi, you never saw any such facility as this. 
I was awed from day one. I walked in the annual conference. Bishop Coles was a bishop, and I thought, you mean to tell me Negroes got a church like this? What a, what a, what a, what a history, what a story. And stories, uh, when I heard the name of Catherine Gasper, who I knew, uh, the Pitts family, of course, the uh, Price family, and on and on and on. And then to have these two young preachers, Reverend Lynn and Reverend Hill, come to seminary, uh, drive up and down 75 for three to four years, six years. <laughs> uh, navigating the traffic and jobs uh, to go to seminary. That's, that's a testimony to the kind of folk you are. Uh, and certainly, I uh, thank you for welcoming back your son, uh, Reverend Hill, uh, and receiving him. That always is a bit of bittersweet because uh, people who knew you when you were younger tend to keep you there. They praise you where they used to know you. And it's sometimes difficult for them to transition and realize that you ain't all that you used to be. You're far more. In fact, you are not all that you used to be. I'm not all I used to be. This church is not all it used to be. So we all have made some morphing, some changing over the years. And so I thank you, my brother, for your leadership, for the sacrifice, and all that you bring as a leader of this congregation at such a time as this. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for another Sunday morning. We can only remember the days when our people longed for Sunday. After the arduous work of work, dealing with bad news, troubles, they could gather in a place like this praise your name, to hear a word from you in song through prayers and fellowship. So bless now this moment. Bless this your preacher. We may hear a word from you. For the grass does wither, the flower fades, but your word endures forever. In the name of him who died one Friday afternoon, three days later, you raised him with all power and the heaven and earth in his hand. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. When you have the time, I would invite you to read Revelations chapter 2 and 3. I know you read it, don't you? You're not afraid to read Revelation, I hope. But Revelation chapter 2 and 3 contain letters or messages to the churches of Asia Minor, seven churches to be exact. The spirit, the messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord speaks to those seven churches. But I ask you to read all, both chapters because historically, we have used each church as if it was a silo. Over the years, biblical scholars have concluded that the writer of John's Gospel, really, I mean, Revelation, really meant for these to be seen as a completion, seven, completion, whole, representative of the whole church in these seven churches of Asia Minor. It is from that background, then, I want to use for a subject today, the church at its best. The church at its best. It is very common these days to hear churchgoers and non-churchgoers offer a bad report about the church. Sometimes that is more from people who are in church than those who are non-churchgoers. It has become habitual. We've developed a culture. It's become popular 
one of the ways you are accepted is to talk how bad the church is, not how good it is. And if we talk about how good it is, we always reference it in the past, not the present, nor the future. But I want to talk about the church at its best. And these two chapters in Revelation, I believe, give us a picture of the church at its best because every now and then, every church ought to think about who are we when we are at our best. Or you may want to ask yourself personally, who am I when I'm at my best? Yes, my brother, I'm a great Braves player, play, not player, watcher. And I'm thrilled to no end to see their tremendous record and how agile and, and how fun-loving they are having time winning games these days. But as I've known the Braves over the years, they've had the World Series championship since I've been alive. But I, I think they may be at their best right now. Now, the rest of the season will tell. But right now, they are at their best. They're hitting almost on every all nine cylinders. And we're ecstatic who are Braves fans. But they have not arrived at this with, without somebody having a vision of what a good Braves team would look, look like what kind of players we need, what kind of pitchers we need, what kind of hitters we need, and how kind of speed we need to run the bases. All of that goes into the conception of what makes for a good team. Somebody has to conceptualize that. It just doesn't happen. And so it is with a church. Churches only become as good as the leaders who envision them becoming and the members who likewise follow. So as we celebrate 100, 184, I hear 185 occasionally, 184, one year doesn't make a difference. The reality is you have shown how to persevere. You have shown how to endure. You have shown how to be faithful with much and with little. You've shown that God is still a God of abundance in the midst of scarcity. You've shown that God can take small numbers and yet make things happen. For that is a record of the Holy Scriptures. God never uses the majority. If you don't believe that, ask Gideon. God always uses the most inconspicuous people to run with. Even Jesus shows 12 people that most of us would not have said amen to. So God majors with that which looks like it ain't much. I'm a testament to that. If you ever look up on the map, Oakland, Mississippi, in fact, if you ever have a chance to go down from Memphis, down Highway 55 towards Jackson, or go from Jackson up towards Memphis, you would miss it. It's right on the interstate. The sign is right there. And I, even when I presided there, I had folk to ask me, what do you say your, your town is? It's right there on the sign. But Charleston, Mississippi is also on the sign. And most folks see Charleston and never see Oakland. But thank God, God didn't miss Oakland. I'm a living testimony to the fact that God found me in that country town of Oakland. Well, the church, as we celebrate it today, has innumerable attributes and contributions. When I can just imagine in my own mind and imagination, the children, not Christian, my sister, but baptized here, baptized over the years, infants baptized, adults baptized. People who got married here, had children here. People who were buried, funeralized here. People who got religion here. Folk who were nurtured and encouraged, inspired, 
and empowered by this congregation. The list is just innumerable. Only heaven can tell your story. Preachers who have come through and the sermons preached, choirs that have sang, and all that has gone over the years, Sunday schools and the teachers who have taught Sunday schools, and yes, Sister Jasper and all of that crowd who labored with love and hope and pride, believing that they were part of the best church in America. Osa Temple, dear me, and Macon, Macon, Georgia. church at its best is suggested by Revelation chapters 2 and 3. But let me warn you, when you read Revelation chapter 3, 2 and 3, you will discover a checkered story. Only two of the seven churches get a passing grade. Five of them get marks. In other words, my, my pet peeve is that the church is a messy miracle. And anybody who expects to find a church on earth that is not that, show it to me. It's a messy miracle. And it's messy because it's got folk in it. I'm not talking about you all. I, 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 I'm talking about folk. But wherever human beings have a role, whatever it is, we bring our faults and our failures, our misgivings, all of that to the task. I, I'm astounded to this day that God would even choose fallen humanity to be a part of God's salvation plan. I'm astounded that God would even choose people like me to preach the gospel. But God majors in flawed people because God knows if I can help you in your flawedness, you could help somebody else in their flawedness. But if you come Pharisaic or Sadducee and you think you got it all together, everybody else is wrong but you, God says, no, can't use you. I need folk who know what it's like to be a sinner to help save sinners. Well, quickly then, since my sister said we would not be here all day, uh, and I've got an annual conference starting tomorrow, and I just left the conference in Columbus yesterday, drove back to Atlanta last evening, and then got a little water over me and got dressed again to come down here because I tried my best after I gave my word to this preacher that I would be here today. I tried my best to get out of it. Not because I didn't like you all, but I realized what a mess I'd gotten myself in. I went from Brunswick last Monday in conference in South Georgia to Columbus last Thursday through yesterday in annual conference and then drove back to Atlanta, put some clothes in the floor and got some more clothes, got me a bath, and here I am today. That's crazy, isn't it? But God uses crazy people. Well, let me quickly. As I have studied these seven churches, what jumps out at me is that when you read each one, there's a message from the Lord of the church. Each one, each letter begins with a message from its Lord. And what I like about it, every message to the, each church gives a different representation of that Lord. So that you and I who tend to see Christ in one way can now see Christ in a broader way. He's Alpha and Omega, some folks say. But either way you put it, he's always uniquely presented. And so the church at its best is a church that's always aware and under the authority of its Christ. Every church that matters, that remains the church, understands 
as Matthew 16 said, on this rock, I'll build not Thomas Brown's church, but my church. And wherever the church is built on, in faith on Jesus Christ, it be, remains a church. Flawed, yes. Messy, yes. But it remains the church. And so these churches get a message from he who is in authority. And whenever the church is at its best, it's always aware that we get our orders, not from the bishop alone, not from a pastor or presiding elder, but ultimately we get our authority from he who is our Lord and Savior. And every now and then we have to remind ourselves of that. Because as human beings, sometimes we think it's my church, our church. And there's nothing wrong with you claiming wholesale as my church. You ought to be able to say that with pride and with thanksgiving, but it ain't your church as much as I possess it, I claim it is mine. It is the Lord's church. And if it's the Lord's church, then my orders ought to be taken from the Lord of the church. And every now and then we have to remind ourselves that I must study his word, that I may know what he would have me say, Every now and then I must discern his ways that I may know how I must carry myself. Every now and then I must think about his witness that I may discover what my witness ought to be like. It's the Lord's church. Bishop Lakey tells the story about missionaries that went to overseas to Africa uh, to spread the gospel and the missionary would retire every day by boiling his soup, and while his soup was cooling, he would say his prayers. One day he got up from his knees and came back to the table, and the soup was gone. The cat slipped in while he was saying his prayers and lapped up the soup. So he didn't whip the cat. He simply the next day boiled his soup, tied up the cat, and then said his prayers. And from then on, until he died, that's what was his practice. Boil the soup, tie the cat, say his prayers. Well, those who had observed him do this ritual every day, decided after his death, let's carry it on. We'll boil our soup, tie up the cat, and then say our prayers. But then, eventually, they had a church conference. And at the church conference, some officers stood up and said, Brother Pastor, I, I move that we stop boiling soup and we stop saying prayers and let's just tie up cats. Isn't that something of what happens to church? That we spend our time with stuff that really don't matter? The soup doesn't matter. The prayers don't matter. We busy ourselves tying up cats. So the church at its best always is aware that we are God's people, that Christ has died for us and saved us and is sanctifying us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, our orders come from him. But not only is the church at its best when it realizes that its orders come from Christ, it also realizes that it is accountable to him who is the Lord. Read the letters, the seven letters here to the church. Each one, there's a phrase that says, I know your works. Every, every church that receives a message, I know your works. The last church, Laodicea, I know you're lukewarm. The first church, Ephesus, you've lost your first love. And on and on. Each one received the message. As I mentioned earlier, only two of them got an A. And the others got checks. I know your works. Wouldn't it make a difference in our lives if we every now and then thought about I'm accountable? I say to the preachers in the annual conference, we gra gravit gravitated to an age now where everybody thinks they're their own, own, own authority. 
They get your ordinations from the church or in your conference. I'm Reverend so-and-so deacon. I'm Reverend so-and-so a traveling elder. And then in full connection, I'm on my own now. I don't need to report back to y'all. But it's a shame of anybody who thinks that they are that good that you don't need to be accountable to somebody. Nobody's going to get to heaven by yourself. As much as we preach individualistic religion in this world, in this country, that if I got religion, if I make it, anybody will. That ain't true. We are all in this together, and therefore we need each other. I need you. You need me. We're all God's children, and therefore we need each other's gifts and graces if we're going to make it. So we must be accountable. And so each one is given a testimony of what their works are. Some churches, several churches were persecuted. Another church has uh, a Nickelodeon in there with teaching false things. You're tolerating false teaching. Some have been persecuted. Every church has its woes. And the, the Lord says, I know your works. And it and in most of the churches, the best churches in Revelation 2 and 3, the word faithfulness, you have been enduring, is the word that comes back. I know it, despite what you've faced, you have been faithful, you have endured. The best church is that church that keeps on kicking, even though they get a lot of licking. The best church does not fold in opposition. The best church does not fold on the conflicts. The best church does not fold when their divisiveness and their clicks. The best church rises above that because it realizes we are accountable to our Christ. I'm about to take my seat. Third of the best church, not only knows and assured of who the source of authority in secondly is accountable to that authority, but thirdly, it is assured that we are victorious people because we serve a victorious Christ. Now, those of us who have not read through the Gospels to the end of the Gospel see a Christ who comes in on what we call Christmas looking like the darling of the world. Angels in Luke's gospel are singing his praises. Simeon and Anna come out and say, oh, we've been waiting for this for a long time. Matthew gives a, a 20 a generation of a piece where this man called Jesus comes through 42 generations. Check it history, but he comes out, his mother is a virgin. And somehow in, incarnated, he comes as the son of God. It looks like a rather rosy picture, but he encounters from day one challenges. Even his own mama and, and brothers and sisters call him out and say, are you crazy? We didn't raise you like this in Nazareth. Where did you get all this stuff from? His response simply is, anybody who doesn't follow me is not my mama, my brother, my sister. You're somebody else's child. My brothers and sisters, we've got to be assured that this journey is not in defeat. No matter how much bad news we hear and no matter how much bad news we see, we must believe that the Christ we serve gives us the victory. Read, go back and read Revelations 2 and 3. Each one of these churches are told, he that overcometh, that's the victory. You got opposition, you got challenges before you, but he or she who overcomes will get rewards. I'm a believer. After all these years of preaching and teaching and serving the church, I do not want to end up saying this is just for naught. Now, I know everybody wants to go to heaven. Some folk only in church because that's their only motive. They want to go to heaven. But I, I want a piece of heaven here. I, I want to get a glimpse of the bliss of heaven in the church fellowship. I want to experience the joy and the love and the hope 
that comes from heaven that's already on earth in, our, in us because the Holy Spirit gives us that kind of joy, peace, and love, and power right here. And so, as believers of Jesus Christ, the church at its best is always overcoming. The church at its best is always being victorious. When they count you out and think you're through, Jesus said, no, just look at me. They thought I was through. They put me in a borrowed grave. In fact, it was borrowed. That means I won't be there long. But they put a stone there to say we're through with you. And one gospel said they even put a guard there to make sure nobody stole his body. But that third day morning, the stone got rolled away. And the gods had to lie about what happened. Because he who they thought was dead was not dead. In the Bar Barnaby um, and Bailey circles, there's a story about a, a tiger show. Some of you have seen it on TV. There's a man in a cage with a whip. The tiger is moving around in the cage. Well, one night while this man was in the cage, Moving the tigers around, the lights went out. Looked like forever. And they just knew when the lights came back on, that brother was going to be destroyed. When the lights came back on, he was still topping his whip. And the tigers were still moving around. And somebody asked him, didn't you freeze? Didn't you get scared? Said, yeah, I got scared. But how did you keep popping your whip? He said, because while I couldn't see the tigers, I knew they could see me. But I didn't want them to know that I could not see them. So I kept popping my whip. And I survived the night popping my whip. I come by Holster Temple. I know the road is rough and the mountains are high. And the valleys are low sometimes. But if you are a child of Jesus Christ, you ought to keep popping your whip. If you are a child of him who died and was raised from the dead, you and I ought to believe that there's a better day coming. If you are children of Jesus Christ and you know what it's like to be saved from your sins and to be rectified and restored in relationship with Christ, and you can declare, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see you ought to keep popping your whip. I believe that this is not the best day. The best day is on its way. The church at its best knows who is its authority. The church at its best is accountable to that authority. The church at its best believes we are on victory lane. Eventually, we will see the victory. If that's not true, keep your Bibles closed. If that's not true, stop playing. If that's not true, stop preaching. If that's not true, stay home. But if it's true, make sure you read and study your word. Make sure you stay on bending knees and make sure you keep praising him who deserves all our praise, all our thanksgiving. He who has delivered us over and over again, woke us up early this morning and started us on our way. He who keeps on keeping on. You ought to be willing to say, I'll go. Wherever he wants me to go, I'll be whoever he wants me to be. I'll say whatever he wants me to say because I know what he can do. I'm an example of his word. So good day, my brothers and sisters. Congratulations to you. I pray that God will give you strength to run on to see what the end is going to be. I stand now to extend the invitation to Christ. 
I'm aware that most of us in here, I suspect, have at one point said yes to Jesus. At some point, for the price you've said, I believe in him, that he's my Lord and Savior. I've confessed him. John Romans 10 says, if you confess with your lips, leave and you shall be saved. But this ain't a one-time decision. On this journey, you and I have to renew that commitment. From time to time, you and I have to ask him to restore us to that commitment. Every now and then, you ought to say, Lord, I have failed. I had good intentions, but good intentions don't get me there. I failed. And yes, I sometimes join that crowd who say, you remember, the Lord knows I'm only human. But only human won't get you there. Or maybe you say, well, I've been in the church all my life. I'm secure because I'm in the church. But then I must ask the question, is the church in me? Some others say, I come to church. But do you bring the church with you? And so I invite you to think about that for a moment. What might the Lord be calling you and I to do as we celebrate this historic 184th anniversary? Surely the Lord I know doesn't want us to continue to be just as we are. The Lord I know who keeps calling us to higher ground, to the next level, is always challenging us to take up our cross daily and follow him. So I'm not going to ask you to come to the altar because you know the altar is physical. But do you know you got an altar in your heart? Right there in your heart you've got an altar. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment where you are. And just think, where am I with the Lord? Where am I with the Lord's church? What does the Lord calling me to be and do now? And if you hear his voice, I pray that you will say to him, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I am available again. Yes, Lord, I'm willing now. Yes, Lord, I believe that you can do more with me than you've done with me in the past. Yes, Lord, I am your servant. Mold me, make me, form me any way you feel necessary. In the name of him who is our Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the people of God said amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. And one more time, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop, for always bringing your inspiring messages. And to 
Dr. Brown, with your beautiful self, we love you. Thank you so much. Uh, can we get a little hand for our little choir that we got together? <laughs> Listen, brother, myself, Michael, uh, uh, Teresa, Luana. Now, when Miss Jasper brought that thing on way back in the day, uh, we were somebody. Amen. Amen. Thank you, RC2. Or three more people that should have been on up in the choir with us, but we get you next time now. Now that we know we, are, we, still, we still got a little to, to offer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles, for that wonderful history. Um, all of the volunteers. Bishop, we have some volunteers and we have some voluntold. And most of them were voluntold. <laughs> but that's okay, because when you can call somebody and say, listen, the church needs you, what can I do? And that's what all of us, thank you, my daughter, my special daughters, Mallory and Avrio. you all are such beautiful daughters. Thank you all. Thanks to my family that come down from Jeff up from Jeffersonville and down from Atlanta. We really do thank you. Now I can't see that far. What you saying? I said, Akira, yes, yes. Akira had her little baby and she was like, I'm coming to sing. Bring the baby on and come on sing. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, all of our guests for joining us this morning in person, on Zoom or live stream. Thank you, Reverend Hill, for voluntolling me the position of the chairman of this worship service. Thank you for having confidence in me. And thank everybody. Thank you, and you, Zena, you pray us on in all the time. Thank you, God, for your spirit. Thank you. Amen. Well, thank everyone who participated uh, in our celebration today, our anniversary. Um, I won't repeat because I, I, again, I just thank everybody who participated. Um, and I thank Lynn uh, for the sacrifices she made because Lynn has challenges. And, but yet, she still allows God to use her with a thorn in her side. And, and that's what the message is to all of us. It's good to see everyone that is here today. Um, hadn't had this since January the 1st when we first opened back up and tried to, to worship in person. We all have a mission. We all been touched in certain ways in this church. And one of the things when I grew when I uh, when I graduated from, from a college and I ended up coming back to Macon to work. Because <clears throat> while I was in college, I was sort of absent from the church, right? But when I come back home, I felt that I needed, I needed to give back something to the church that gave, that put so much into me. And so I didn't know then that I'd be here now, but Lord has a way of working things out. Thank you for, again, uh, having the desire to be with us today, to worship with us today. I pray, I pray that it's not the last time that we see each other in the next 365, but that you are, we are welcome to come always because we're here now. And we thank God for allowing us to, because of the pandemic, he, he, he pushed us out to now proclaim his word 
through uh, through the mechanisms of social media. And uh, we just thank you for all that you continue to bless. Because we couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I can't do it. I still can't do it without you, without your support, without your prayers. This church can't do it without your support, without your prayers, without your gifts. I'm finished. I'm going to let Bishop come back with his last remarks and close us out with the benediction. I want to thank our brother Gasson over there. I mean, all of us who have memories. It's just God using us in a special way. Thank Zena, because Zena, Zena, you remember Zena's so quiet? She's not quiet anymore. <coughs> She's the prayer warrior. And we just, that's amazing how God can use you if you let God use you. Bishop, then come now. Again, thank you very much, um, Pastor Hill, First Lady Hill, and officers and members here for this invitation. Um, one of the reasons we drove back to Atlanta on last evening uh, and then back here was uh, our son who uh, coaches now with the, the uh, no, he's not with um, Carolina Panthers, offensive coordinator. But I don't say that to, to highlight that per se, but, but he's taught me much about life through football. He started playing when he was eight years old. And I would take him to practice. And I noticed something. They would practice almost every evening, but they went through the same plays over and over and over again. And I said to him one evening, I said, Thomas, aren't you bored? No, daddy, I ain't bored. I said, y'all run the same plays, and if you mess it up, he, Coach will make you run it back again. He said, I ain't bored because, you know, Friday night we're going to play in the game. Ah, now I better understand. But then the game, they huddle up, and they thought I could coach a little bit. So when he was eight or nine years old, they had me as one of the assistant coaches. I didn't know nothing about no football. Uh, but I was just glad to be in the huddle. But I realized how important the huddles were, Brother Price. And so I say that to say to you as a church, and I know we people blame the, the pandemic on everything. But this ain't the first time we've had an adversity in the life, maybe in our lives, but not the first time. Remember who is your savior and Lord. He's a coach and he's calling you to pull up because there's some plays he want to teach you that you can learn on the sideline. You need to be in the hole. And if you don't pull up, you don't create chemistry that's necessary for movement. So I implore you, given all the risks that's involved, because the world is waiting on us. There is no other group. You may be a Trump follower, Trump ain't gonna solve the problem. Or a Biden follower, Biden ain't gonna solve the problem. I know of only one who has the answer to the world's plight. I trust we won't give up on him. Amen. Amen. The Central Georgia region will be meeting tomorrow morning at 8.30 at a great, another great church in Macon called Hosey, not Hosey, Bethel. I started to say you were the only great church, but no. Bethel Church over on Pinona. At 8 30 in the morning we'll end hopefully wednesday around noon two and a half day session if you can if you're around we would love to have you come and share in annual conference 
Having said that, Dr. Louise, would you stand again? Um, this young lady has been traveling with me since 1970. We started dating in college in 1970. I started preaching in 1972. So she was there when I preached my first five minute sermon. She's been with me from Durant, Mississippi, all over Georgia, right now. And last, yesterday, she celebrated 51 years of marriage to me. 51 years. Now, I don't know what preservative she uses, but whatever it is, I'm trying my best to get a piece of that preservative because she looks almost like she did 51 years ago. Amen. Love you, baby. Thank you. And now, God, we thank you for this worship experience here at this great church. For its rich history, for all the ways you have blessed and kept it over the years. We commend these, your people, this pastor, first lady, to your hands. We ask now that you would imbue them with strength inspire them with your Holy Spirit and give them shoes that will not wear out even though the road is rough. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the loving companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you now not only for 184, 185 years to come, but for eternity, world without end. And the people of God said, Amen.